I can't walk, uh, but there's lots of things that we need uh, in order to get to where we can send out 120, 150 people uh, to go door to door. And so uh, if you're available to make phone calls, if you're available to come in and count flyers or count homes on a map, things like that, you can use that towards your 24 hours. But uh, we're just glad that everything went well yesterday, and we had a beautiful day to go out, and the Lord blessed us there. So just looking forward to the fruit that will come from yesterday's uh, outreach. It's good to have those back from the cruise who went on the cruise, and it's good to have the Rochesters here today. The Rochesters will be singing for us in the morning service, and they're always a blessing when they're here. I um, want to just mention a couple of things. Miss Rebecca is out of town, so... Um, I'm kind of keeping a roll this morning as well. She's our, she's our Sunday school secretary. Brother Jim Morton is our uh, visitation outreach guy for our Sunday school class. Brother Steve Hawthorne is going to be our visitor, uh, our visitor uh, coordinator. He's going to be uh, the one who's uh, coming to you if you're visiting and getting uh, your information. But we're glad that you're here today. Um, one thing that we do want to announce this morning is April 18th. If you'll mark that on your calendar. This is going to be a day at our church where we have an end of life uh, seminar. And uh, nobody wants to think about end of life and nobody wants to think about putting those things in order. But we would ask that you would do that, get everything in order for the sake of your family, for the sake of your church. Just makes everything so much smoother. If I can give an example of somebody who did it the right way, it would be Ron Fisher. And uh, I hope that I say this enough to where you're like, he's already said this so many times. But I want you to understand what a difference it is uh, when, you, uh, when you make these decisions ahead of time. Ron Fisher had everything written down. He had everything taken care of. He had everything picked out. He had his, uh, right down to the very songs at his funeral. We knew exactly. His wife knew exactly. It was his wishes. It was exactly what he wanted. Now I could name some other names, but I won't do it because I don't want to dishonor them in any way because they're good people. But uh, we need to make sure that we're part of this April 18th end of life seminar. Uh, preacher's got some things that he needs to take care of. He's got a new son now, so he needs to make sure he uh, adapts everything. We've got a new daughter, and so we've got to make sure we make some changes as well. But just have those things together, and that's going to be April 18th for the end of life seminar, and then March 28th for the next 24-hour visitation. So uh, some things that we need to definitely um, think about. Let's go ahead and get ready to take our offering this morning. All of our offering will go to building maintenance, and these guys will just go ahead and uh, come down and collect that. And while they're doing that, let's go ahead and take prayer requests. If anybody has a prayer request this morning, um, I preached on Wednesday night just about praying for one another. And we need to pray for one another. This is something that's very important. And uh, in Colossians, not First Colossians, but in Colossians, uh, we find a, a, great, a great diagram, a great list of things that we need to pray for one another for. And so, uh, any prayer requests this morning? Anything at all? Something on your heart? I'd ask that you pray for Alice Johnson. She was transferred from the Springs at Boca Ciega to uh, Palms of Pasadena Hospital. And uh, she's in uh, bad condition, so we need to pray for her. Pray for Herb. Herb also uh, was getting checked into the hospital yesterday because uh, he just wore out taking care of her and going back and forth and the stress of all of that, and he's hurt his legs somehow. So be praying for Herb and Alice Johnson for sure. Anybody else this morning? Yes. Definitely pray for the Meachams. Normally Tuesday is their day, is that correct? So always pray for the Meachams on Tuesday. Anybody else this morning? Yes, Brother Drexler. This is a great time to live in Florida. Let me just explain and remind you. 
if you ever wonder and question why we live in Florida, it's for these moments, not the moments that come at the end of July and in August. Uh, Russell Tinsley, is that correct? All right, we'll pray for him for sure. Anybody else this morning? Any other prayer requests? How many of you have an unspoken today, unspoken request? Several. All right, uh, yes, ma'am. Did you? Okay, you were going to do an unspoken. Great. Anybody else with a spoken? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll jump into our lesson this morning. Lord, we do thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, I think about Alice and Herb this morning. I pray that you would just be with them, be with the doctors and the team of doctors that will diagnose and figure out what's going on with each of them. Father, I pray that you'll encourage them. Thankful for our church family and those who've gone to visit and those who've sent cards. But Father, we're thankful most of all that they know you as Savior and their testimony of their service through this place. And Lord, I pray that you would just um, be with the Meachams, Lord, as uh, every Tuesday, Lord, just a difficult, difficult day for them as they have treatment. Father, I pray for those in our church and those that um, our church family knows, Lord, over 30 people who have cancer. Lord, I pray for them specifically, Lord, that you'd be with them, that you'd encourage, that you would uh, continue to work with the treatments to help them be cancer-free. Lord, I pray for Russell Tinsley this morning. And, Lord, I pray that you'd be with him and encourage him. Lord, thankful for our preacher, thankful for the time that they had to get away. Father, be with the Rochesters as they minister today. And then also, Lord, as we look at Revelation, Lord, we're excited about your coming. But, Father, while we're here, help us to be busy about the things that you would have us to do. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, turn your Bible to Luke chapter number 4. Luke chapter number 4, we're going to read two different passages of Scripture as we look at the healing of uh, Peter's mother-in-law. We're going to read two different passages, uh, one by Luke and one by um, Mark this morning, just two different accounts of the same thing that happened. And uh, as you're turning there, I want to just give you a couple of jokes. Um, mother-in-law jokes are great, and uh, I have a mother-in-law. She's probably watching online, so I have to be careful but David was finally engaged, and he was so excited to show off his new bride. He said, Mom, I'm going to bring three girls home, and I want you to guess which one is my fiancé. Sure enough, 20 minutes later, David walks into the door with three girls that followed him. Without even hesitating, she pointed and said, it's that one. He said, holy cow, how did you figure that out so quickly? She said, the moment I saw her, I didn't like her. And the last one, a man and his wife and his mother-in-law went on vacation to the Holy Land, and while they were there, the mother-in-law passed away. The undertaker told them, you can have her shipped home for 5000 or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for 1500 The man thought about it for a moment, but he decided that he'd have her shipped home. The undertaker didn't understand it. It would cost you $5,000 to ship her home, but you could have her buried here in the Holy Land for 1500 the man replied, a, a man died here 2,000 years ago, and when he was buried three days later, he rose again. And I just can't take that chance. <laughs> just can't take that chance. Luke chapter number 4. We'll start in verse 38, reading through 44. The last time that we spoke, um, Jesus was in the synagogue, and Jesus had cast out uh, a demon while he was teaching and while he was uh, speaking in the synagogue. He was interrupted by a man who was possessed by a demon. And uh, we talked about the fact that he, uh, he, he commanded those demons to come out. And uh, this passage of scripture um, happens right after he leaves the synagogue. Verse number 38. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with, with a great fever. And they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him. And he laid his hand on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying and saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. 
And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for therefore I am sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. Now if you would turn to Mark chapter number 1, we're going to read the same account, just from a different writer, a different perspective, and then we'll jump right into our lesson. Mark chapter number 1. Same series of events here. Jesus has just called the demon out of the man in the synagogue. And then in verse number 29, if you remember, we left off at verse 28 last week. Verse 29, And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into a house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife lay sick of a fever. And Anon, they tell him of her and he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up and immediately the fever left her and she was ministered and she ministered unto them and at even when the sun did set they brought unto him all that were diseased and all that were possessed with devils and all of the city was gathered together at the door and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered them not to speak because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when he had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach therefore, or, or there also, for therefore came I forth. I want to just show you a little bit of a map here as we get started. If you remember, the first miracle took place. The water turned into wine. It happened in uh, Canaan and uh, Cana of Galilee. And uh, then the second miracle also happened in Cana, but the miracle took place in Capernaum. Um, Jesus was walking, and a noble man came up to him and began to tell him about his son. And his son had a fever, so we know one thing's for sure. There's something that's going around Capernaum because both of these people had a fever, both of these people were very sick, both of these people were at the point of death. So the first miracle happened in Cana of Galilee, the second one, um, Jesus spoke in Cana, but the miracle took place in Capernaum. Now we see that we're in Capernaum, when the man, uh, when the devil was brought out of the man, and now we see that also Simon Peter lives in Capernaum. And this is just a Google Earth picture that I took last night, I think it's good for us to remember that when we, when we talk about these places, this is a real place. The Sea of Galilee is a place that exists. And uh, you can see Capernaum there. And if I were to zoom in on my Google Earth, you would see that C- Capernaum is now just in ruins. Um, it's no longer a city that is used. But this is where this miracle takes place. The first thing I want you to see here is the woman with a high fever. This is Peter's mother-in-law. We know that Peter's a good guy because um, they're talking to Jesus. Uh, They've seen what Jesus can do now. They know that he has power, and they know that he is all power. And they see that Jesus is able to perform miracles. And here's somebody that, believe it or not, Peter loves. And all of the disciples and those that are with Jesus continue to talk to him about this woman and how uh, Peter's mother-in-law was going to die if something didn't take place. I thought it was interesting that between the two passages, if you look at Luke and you look at Mark, they describe the fever a little bit different. Uh, Luke talks about the fact that, or uh, Mark talks about the fact that it was a fever. But Luke, the doctor, says it was a great fever. This was a bad fever. This just wasn't a fever. This was a very difficult thing that was going to take place, and this was something that was probably going to take this woman's life. So we see the woman... With a high fever, we know that this is Peter. Uh, another thing that we notice from this passage is that Peter uh, lives very close to the synagogue. Um, it, the, what, what, what people have studied is, is about 100 yards from the synagogue. They left the church house, and they go uh, to Peter's house, and they find this woman with a high fever. Then we see that the woman is healed. 
we know that Jesus can do this. We know that he can do this uh, just through speaking 20 miles away. He healed someone from Canaan of Galilee in Capernaum. And here the Bible says that he reaches down and he takes her hand and he lifts her up. And this woman is healed. And uh, this wasn't just a healing. It was a complete restoration of strength. Uh, when we get sick, and I remember I've had pneumonia twice, and uh, when you have pneumonia or you have some type of a sickness, it just it wears you out, and you have no energy, and you have no strength. And I know, uh, Miss Granger, you've had pneumonia before as well, and it takes weeks to get to where you feel like you're, you're getting to be your normal self or 100%. And it's just something that takes it out of you. And a fever is something that will do that as well. A fever is something that is just so uncomfortable and it just wears you out. And you haven't been eating the way that you're supposed to be eating, so your strength is gone. We don't know how long she laid there, but we know that uh, she's been sick for a while to the point where it's about to take her life. But when Jesus touches you, when Jesus heals you, you have full strength. The Bible says... Not only did the woman have a high fever and the healing of the woman, but we see the woman helping. The woman helping. The Bible says immediately that she got up and began to minister. She began to serve. And so this was a complete restoration of her strength. Well, this was a complete healing. You know, uh, I've been wanting to say this the last couple of weeks. Whenever you see like these healing services and these TV guys, um, there's all these lights and there's all this music and there's all this noise and you got these people that are falling over and you have all of this commotion that's going on, yet all of the miracles of Jesus are pretty quiet. It's a pretty somber thing. Most of the time when you see these miracles of Jesus, you see somebody who's heartbroken for a loved one. You think about the nobleman's son and how he just continued to be persistent and say, if you don't do something, my son's going to die. We see here that the, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, boy, they were continually coming to him and saying, uh, we've got to do something. She's close. She's only 100 yards away. You've got to come and see her. We see the woman is helping. These TV guys and all the commotion and all of this, Jesus just reaches down and takes her hand. Just the touch of Jesus. Before, with the nobleman's son, all he said was, Go, thy son liveth. It's not all of this stuff, it's not all of these lights, it's not all of these cameras. But her strength was fully restored. These healing services, when somebody gets out of the wheelchair and they say, Be healed, they start off all slow and it's all an act. But this woman the one that was just about ready to die, she stands up and she starts doing what I think she always does and she starts to serve other people. We see the woman helping. We see the word is out. The word gets out very quickly. We saw this last week. That boy, when Jesus commanded that devil to come forth and that devil did everything in his power, it screamed and it, it held on and shook that body, but it had no it had no other option than to come out of that body. Boy, the Bible says that immediately he was, he was, his fame was spread about. Immediately everybody went to tell. And uh, the word is out that Jesus is performing miracles. And the word is out that people that are about to die are being completely heal, healed in full um, strength is given back to them. And we see that the word is out. And we see that after dark, Remember what day this is. This is the Sabbath day still. This is still the Sabbath day. It's the same day where Jesus was preaching and teaching in the synagogue. And that devil was um, brought out of that man. But at dark, once that Sabbath time was over, people began to come to Jesus. And the Bible is very clear that um, these people waited intentionally for the Sabbath to be over because they did not want to break any of the uh, Pharisees' laws. They didn't want to break any of the things that had been set up. And they start to bring all of these people, all of these, these diseases, all of this stuff that people has. And one of the accounts says that the whole city was at Peter's door. Everybody was there. 
Everybody showed up to see and to be healed and to, and to deal with the, the certain situations that they have. And can I say this, that everybody has something. Everybody has something that they're going through. Everybody has difficulties. And just like all of the previous miracles, we've got to go to the same person that they went to. You know, it's interesting. There's so many self-helps and there's so many things that we can turn to and there's so many worldly solutions to get through our problems and to help us with addictions and do all of this stuff. But the truth of the matter is, if we're going to get real help, we'll do what these people did, and that's come to Jesus. But they wait till dark and then they all come and we see the work continued. You have to understand that it's dark now. Jesus had already preached in the synagogue. He'd already been to Peter's house. They've been ministered unto. It's now dark. This is a time where you'd normally start to close up shop. This is a time where uh, uh, you'd be turning in to go to sleep because there's not a lot of light. There's not a lot of things to do after dark. But these people start to come and we see the work continued. And this happens and it goes late into the night. But then we see the way to refresh. You know what Jesus does after this long day of ministry? The Bible says that he gets up very early. And he gets away. And he gets alone to spend some time with his father. You know, I think there's a lot of things that we think that we need to be refreshed. Boy, if I could just get away on a cruise, I think it would be refreshing. Well, I think if I could just have some time alone, if I could get away from my kids, if I could get away from my wife for a while, if I could just have a little bit of alone time, or if I could go do this uh, thing that I enjoy, if I could go fish, if I could go do this, man, I feel like I'd get refreshed. We see the way to refreshment in Jesus he goes away and he spends time with the Father. Then in verse 38, we find out why he came. The Bible says that he can't get alone. He's, he's going off to be with the Father. He's going off to spend some time with the Lord. And people follow him. People follow him and they want him to heal more people. But he said, we need to go to other, other cities and preach. We need to tell them. The reason that I came. It's kind of an interesting thing. The people were very interested in having their diseases healed. The people were very interested in seeing their loved ones well again. The people wanted all of these miracles, but the miracles are not why Jesus came. He said, no, we, this is all good and this is all fine, but we need to keep going and we need to go to other cities and we need to be teaching and we need to be preaching because that's why I came. See, I think a lot of times we focus so much on the physical. We focus on the fact that, boy, if my physical issues would be taken care of, boy, my life would be so much better. But Jesus is always more interested in the spiritual side of things than he is the physical. Our spiritual health is so much more important than our physical health. We've got to make sure that our spiritual health is where it should be. Because if our physical health does fail us, we want to make sure that our spiritual health is where it's supposed to be. That our relationship is God with God is right where it's supposed to be. The reason that he came was not to heal the physical problems. It was to heal that spiritual problem that each of us have, and that's the sin that we were born with. That sin nature those things that we do that displease God. That's why Jesus came. I want to give you some applications from this miracle. It's a short miracle. Jesus walks in. He'd heard about the problem. He reaches down. He heals her. She gets up and she starts serving. People start coming after dark. He heals some more. He gets up early in the morning. He gets away. And he tells us, hey, it's not about these physical issues. We're here for the spiritual issue. Applications that we can take from this. Number one, fellowship is important. Fellowship is important. Right after the service, what people do right after the service is very important. 
Boy, if you can't wait to get out, if, you're, if you want to be the first one that's to your car, fellowship is something that is important as Christians. We ought to desire to be around other Christians and desire to have fellowship with other Christians. We see here that they were going to Peter's house. I believe that this was something that was in the plan. This was something that was already going to take place. And um, Peter's mom, mother-in-law is there. And, um, but this is something that we need to be doing. This is something that we, we have to do is fellowship. One of the things we need to do in our class is get some fellowships together and get some times where we get together not just here on Sunday morning, but as individuals, you need to have people in your homes and get to know people. Uh, it's pretty difficult to get to know people during the handshake time. Man, you got three minutes. And then that music's playing and you're going around and you're shaking hands. Man, if you try to carry on a conversation, you're going to get trampled. It's not going to go well with thee, okay? Um, there's no time to get to know somebody here. But fellowship is important. Fellowship is part of God's plan. Uh, secondly, we see that Peter loved his mother-in-law. This is a miracle in and of itself, okay, that we could stay on this. Peter loved his mother-in-law. And uh, as you read about his mother-in-law, and we don't hear a lot about her, but, boy, we see right away what type of person she is. Man, the minute she felt okay, she was serving. The minute she felt okay, she was up and she was doing what she can. Now, let me just say this. Some of you in here are mother-in-laws. Is that true? All right. It is possible for a mother-in-law to love a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law. It's possible. And we see that there's a good relationship here between Peter and his mother-in-law to the point where um, they're continually bringing this, in, this information to him, continually telling him how bad that she is. Peter loved his mother-in-law. Um, when you are touched by Jesus, everything changes. Everything changes. Boy, when Jesus speaks to you, when Jesus does something for you, when Jesus is a part of your life, it changes everything. She went from the point of death to being vibrant and serving. And truthfully, today, I believe that there may be some who are spiritually, you're at the point of death. Your spiritual health, your spiritual life, there's no substance to it. There's nothing there. There's no relationship between you and God. You're not in His Word. You're not reading His Word. And if we get to a point where our spiritual health is in decline, boy, we need a touch of the Savior. The Bible says if you draw nigh to Him, He'll draw nigh to you. And boy, when, when you have Jesus as a part of your life, He changes everything. I like this one a lot. When Jesus is working, people show up. When Jesus is working, people show up. The only thing that is up to you in this life is a right relationship with Him. We talked about this a little bit on Wednesday night. If you're trying to do everything in your power, you're not going to get anything done. It's Jesus. When Jesus is working, people will show up. So you think about uh, a class, you think about a church, you think about a ministry. Boy, what can I do to get more people to come? How can we build this ministry? Boy, we want this to grow. We want this to be great. We want this to move forward. Okay, here's your job. All right, relationship with him. Man, if you're, if you're pleasing the Lord, the Lord's going to work through you. And when the Lord works, people are going to show up. You notice what these verses say. They say that the whole city shows up outside of Peter's house. I don't know how many were in church that day, but boy, they heard that Jesus had done some work. They'd seen that he had done some awesome things. And can I tell you this, that in 2015, Jesus still works. He's still working. And he's going to be working in this service. And he's going to be working through this church. And he worked yesterday through our 24 hours uh, uh, ministry. Can I tell you that Jesus still works? And if Jesus is working, people will show up. You don't have to worry about, oh, how are we going to grow by 20% this year? How are we going to move forward? How are we going to be bigger than we were last year? Your one job, have a right relationship with him. He gives the increase. He's the one. Think about my daughter. She loves pickles. It's the weirdest thing. She loves dill pickles. 
We have these little jars that we buy for, and every time she wants to open it. And she'll sit there, and she'll try, and she'll try. I got it. I'll do it my big girl self, okay? So I just stand there, and she tries and tries, and finally she just hands it to me. <laughs> like, you know, and that's what we've got to do in our spiritual life. We've got to allow Jesus to do the work. If it's us who's trying to do this, it's not going to have any fruit. But when Jesus works, people are going to show up because people need Jesus. They don't need us. They need us to tell them about him. They need us to have a right relationship with him so we have that right testimony and we're that right representation. When Jesus shows up, people show up when Jesus is working. This is a good one. This is a hard one. We need to minister when we're tired. This is a Sabbath day. Sundays are long. Boy, if you're involved at all, we're thinking about our choir members. Our choir members, this is an eight to nine hour work day for them. This is a long day for them. You think about anybody who's in any type of ministry. If you just come to church, it's even a long day. This was a long day of ministry that had already taken place. The synagogue and the teaching and the casting out of devils and uh, the Peter's mom. And then all of a sudden it's dark time. The meal's already been eaten. Everybody's getting ready to rest. There comes knocks on the door. Boy, if you're in ministry, you know, what's that, you know what that's like. But you're not used to knocking on, or opening that door and seeing the city. Everybody from Capernaum is sitting there ready for you to work. And I think it's interesting that we've got to be careful that when we're tired, there's still work to do sometimes. There's still some things that we need to do. And tr the truth of the matter is we can go through a lot of our life and be tired. And uh, we've got to just continue to do the work. Continue to do what we need to do. And then the last thing, we must get alone. We must get alone and have time with God. If Jesus was going to get alone to have time with the Father, I think we need to get alone and have time with the Father. Probably the biggest problem that we have in 2015 is getting alone with God. The distractions, the things that take our time, all of this. If you have a family, it's just busy. If you're in ministry, it's busy. If you work a job, it's busy. Man, life is busy. There's just a lot going on. But one of the most important things that you can do, and I love what it says about Jesus, early in the morning. Man, I think all the disciples were wiped out. I think they were sleeping all around, and they laid on the ground back then. They were sleeping, and they were still near Peter's house. And all of a sudden, they open their eyes, and Jesus is up. Like, what in the world is he doing? Does he realize how late we were out last night? Does he have any idea how late we worked last night and how late it was and how early it is now? And Jesus is gone. One of those verses said that he goes, he's, he's going to a desert place. He's, he's going to get alone with the Father. If we'll do anything for the Lord, it'll be because we have a right relationship with Him. And the only way we'll have a right relationship with Him is when we make this a priority. I know my life's busy. I know there's a lot going on. I'm really tired sometimes. But we've got to get alone with the Lord. We've got to have time where we're just developing that relationship we're, we're getting wisdom from him, and we're getting power that only he can give. Got to spend time with the Lord. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for these miracles that we're going through. Lord, just thank you for your power. Father, I pray that this week, some Lord will just make a decision. I'm going to get alone. I'm going to get alone with my heavenly Father. I'm going to start to focus on my spiritual health as well as my physical health. I'm going to make sure that my relationship with the Lord is right and that it's pleasing to Him and that I'm not trying to do things in my power, but that I'm allowing the Lord to work through me and, Father, allowing Him to do the work. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We've got about 15 minutes before church. Thank you for being here. We're glad that you're here. If you have any questions, anything we can help you with, please let us know. We'll see you at the church service. More video. Oh, wow. 
Yes, sir.